go live. All right. Sorry. Okay. Looks okay. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahavidyan Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastuma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om, very good. Uh, welcome to all of you to our weekly satsang and welcome to all of our uh, online students who attend this uh, satsang. Some are attending in person. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Five dollar <laughs> app. <laughs> um. mm -hmm. Okay, I have no idea if the stream is working at all, so we'll it is okay. I just uh, I don't see any statistics coming up, but it just takes its own time. Welcome to all of you, uh, either watching the uh, satsang live or those of you who would then watch the uh, satsang later. We have a lot of great questions, again, that have come in the past week. Also, during the satsang, you can email me a question. I'll take as many as I can, but I have to apologize in advance. There's no way to take all the questions. We'll do the best we can, and we'll alternate between taking questions from our online students and from our local students. So we'll start online. Okay, this is a question from Arju, and Arju asks, what is the relationship between a realized person and Ishvara, as per Advaita Vedanta? If both are identical, everything is Brahman. So the enlightened person is one who knows everything is Brahman. And then the question comes, as Arjo asks, then how does the enlightened person relate to Ishvara? In fact, how does the enlightened person relate to you if there is only Brahman? And it's simp the answer is surprisingly simple. We we'll use our typical Vedantic example. Let's do something a little different. How about this? A scientist knows this is made of atoms, largely atoms of silica, and those atoms are mostly empty space. So the scientist looks at this as made of clay. Clay is mostly silica atoms and is mostly empty space. Knowing that, can a scientist fill this with water and drink from it? <laughs> no problem, right? Can empty space hold water? Ask the scientist, they'll explain how it works. Yes, absolutely. But notice there are two perspectives. There's a perspective of reality and there's a, respect, a perspective of functionality. Reality, functionality. In, sa in uh, Sanskrit, we, we talk about the reality of something what is satya, and here the reality of this object is clay and nothing but clay. But there's also a functional aspect of this nama rupa, name and form. So if you know it's nothing, this is our Vedantic perspective, what is in my hand, in addition to clay, what is in my hand? Nothing. Can you drink water from clay? Clay, you can't drink, clay is clay, you can't drink water. So from the standpoint of reality, this is nothing but clay. But from the standpoint of nama rupa, functionality, certainly you can fill this with water and drink from it. And it's the same for the uh, enlightened person's relationship with Ishvara and everything else. So even though the enlightened, not even though, the enlightenment, the enlightened person knows all this is nothing but Brahman. Like the scientist who knows this is atoms, 
like the Vedantin who knows this is nothing but clay, in the same way the enlightened person says there is nothing but Brahman. But how hard is it to shift your perspective from clay to pot? Is that hard to do? Easy. In the same way, how hard is it for an enlightened person to shift from the perspective of absolute reality, Brahman, to the relative perspective that there are many individuals here. We are all creations of one Ishvara. These are merely two perspectives and shifting back and forth between the two perspectives is effortless. <coughs> Um, Arjuna's question though comes from a common m notion, misconception, that uh, one who is Brahmanishta, established in Brahman, it only sees Brahman. If you can only see Brahman, how can you find the door <laughs> of the <laughs> to walk out of a room? You get the point. So it, it's. Um, idealistic, impractical, and just not correct. Okay. Um, another question here. Let's see. Uh, Chaitanya. Chaitanya lives in Fremont, California. Chaitanya asks, is anger truly incompatible with enlightenment? What about anger of the selfless kind? Okay, anger of the selfless kind. And he doesn't explain what is the role of an any kind of anger. Um, this anger of the selfless kind, the best example I can think of, an example you may have heard me use before, is when mom is taking care of her two-year-old and the two-year-old is running towards the uh, road. Mom will shout. Hey, <laughs> come back here. Mom sounds angry. Is mom really angry? If she feels anything at all, she might feel fear. She, mom doesn't feel angry. In fact, if mom feels angry, she's got a problem. <laughs> right? What is the reason to get angry? Kids, normal kids, run around. And running towards the street, what to, you know, it's a normal thing. If mom gets angry, she's got a problem. Now, she may sound angry. She may look angry. She may even use her anger to impress upon her child the necessity of not running into the, into the uh, street. But that anger is feigned. It's not real anger. Our usual understanding of anger is a reaction. We say, you get angry. Do you choose to get angry? Ironically, even if you choose not to get angry, and a person goes on poking you and poking you, eventually you get angry. Angry is not something we choose. It's, an, it's a reaction when the force of rajas overtakes our mind, and perhaps tamas, it's an emotional reaction. And why, do you, why does that emotional reaction take place? I mean, we can turn this into a long class of psychology, which we don't want to do, but an enlightened person finds such contentment in the present moment, there is no possibility of inciting anger in that enlightened person. It's impossible. It won't happen. Why? Tell me, if, if you imagine yourself totally, perfectly content, and then somebody comes and says something nasty to you, if your mind is reactive, you could become angry. If you really are enlightened, identified with unchanging consciousness, who cares? Somebody says something bad, 
who cares about it? How does it really, how does it affect unchanging consciousness? Not at all. So, an enlightened person is not subject to the reaction of anger. Means what? I'm smiling because there's no shortage of so-called enlightened people who shout <laughs> and get angry at their disciples for not doing everything right. And then we have uh, mythological stories of certain sages who get angry at their disciples. And they get so angry, shop they tahu, and they go on. <laughs> and then they curse their disciples and all of that. That's evidence of the absence of enlightenment, unless there's a hidden dimension to the story that we don't know anything about. But if it is genuinely an emotional reaction, by the way, anger, you know, just a quick psychological analysis, we respond to a threat with fight or flight, right? Anger is fight. <laughs> Which means you have to feel threatened before that feeling of anger will, will arise. An enlightened person is threatened by what? If you know all of this is less real than you are, all of this is like a bunch of dream elephants, and dream elephants which can't stomp on you, really. There's nothing to fear. An enlightened person has that perspective. There is nothing to be threatened by. Therefore, no impetus for that, um, that uh, fear. Okay. And I'm supposed to delete these. Now they figure out this new new scheme. Oh, what am I doing here? I'm pushing. Yeah, it will work. Okay. One more question. Oh, this is the one. I get rid of this one. Sorry. I'm still, I'm still learning how to do all of this stuff. Okay, we'll take one more question here, and then we'll take some local questions. This question comes from Arun, who lives in Bangalore. Arun asks, some of the Puranas refer to various lokas, like Vaikuntha Loka, Brahma Loka, and so on. Are these lokas mere projections of the mind, like a dream, or do they really exist? Are, are they projections of the mind, like a dream, or do they really exist, or is it something else? I mean, there's not only these two possibilities he gives, so there might be other possibilities as well. Do they really exist if we're thinking about it in terms of a material existence that we experience right now? and we can measure with scientific instruments, do these lokas exist in the same way as this worldly existence? No, they're not, they're not a worldly kind of existence at all. Um, are they merely projections of the mind, which means do we just make up this stuff also? No. <laughs> this is not the product of your mind or my mind, this is a product of these ancient rishis who understood reality in a very different way. I have a feeling that the rishis used these, the idea of loka to represent states of existence that are remote from us, which means we can't confirm. We have no way. If somebody asks you, what happens after you die? Who knows? No one, <laughs> no one has come back to tell us. I mean, there are people who have these so-called near-death experiences, but someone who's been dead for a month or a year, <laughs> none of them have come back to tell us. So there are many things that are beyond our experience. And perhaps these lokas, which are 
mentioned in different Puranic texts. Maybe these are beyond our experience. They're described by these ancient rishis. So instead of calling them mere projections of the mind, that's kind of like a, a writing them off. And I'd, if it comes into Puranas, I don't think we should treat them with such lightness. Or do they really exist? That's a dangerous question in Advaita Vedanta, because in Advaita Vedanta, we take the idea of existence very seriously. So that's why I said, do they exist in the same way as this earthly existence does? No. So another way of understanding it. Okay, let us take some uh, questions here. We'll start here. Um, so yesterday, Good. you said- It uh, worked. <laughs> you said um, we should be using our intellect for decision making, right? But uh, emotions are also given to us. Right. And like, if we just use only intellect, that makes us no different from like being a computer in a sense. Or Did I say use only intellect? No, no. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm just saying because like. Then so the, what what I did say, and it's it a very important topic, comes I think we mentioned it in yesterday's class, comes in a big way in Bhagavad Gita, talking about decision making, and. Okay. Yeah, it's working. Oh, you're looking yes. here. This is confusing. This, what you're seeing, is the live stream, which is delayed by about 10 or 15 oh. seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And this is what's happening in the room right now. So you can ignore this one and just go by this one. <laughs> it's confusing, all oh, this technology. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. Um, so let me, let me uh, summarize this explanation. We talked about decision making, and we have this, what I feel is a very harmful modern concept, follow your heart, which means whatever your emotions tell you to do, do it. You can imagine how many people get <laughs> in trouble <laughs> following that kind, of, that kind of advice. So what... I have said before, based on the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, is your emotions are not well equipped for decision making. To make a decision, you have to weigh various uh, alternatives and see which alternative has more benefit, which alternative has less benefit, and you choose the most beneficial option. This is an activity that our emotions, our emotions are good for feeling things. Emotions are not good for that an analytical comparison. Our intellects are designed for that analytical comparison. For that reason, I said that it's your intellect that needs to be in charge of making a decision, but I never said that your, em your intellect should em ignore your emotions. So the intellect has to consider all the factors in a situation before it makes a decision. <laughs> Tell me, aren't emotions an important factor? Very important factor. So, According, and this is really based on that Ratha Drishtanta, the chariot metaphor that we find in the Kata Upanishad and the Bhagavad Gita and elsewhere. And that is your intellect, in order to follow Dharma properly, your intellect must be in control and make decisions based on all the factors involved, including emotions which are a very, very important factor. So then emotions become not in the follow your heart, emotions alone. Um, you said intellect alone is like a computer, but here we're saying intellect guided by emotions or intellect with uh, considering the emotions. So it's a very subtle, nuanced uh, approach to uh, decision making. Is that any follow-up? Okay. Another question uh, here behind you. You'll need the microphone. Brahman, Brahman is nirguna or non-doer? 
then how does the concept of saguna brahman comes and why did he use maya to create all of us and why does it let us stay behind maya and feel non separate from him okay um you you said thank you you said <laughs> concept vedanta properly understood is not a bunch of concepts i mean we turn it this is a most common mistake that we turn vedanta into an abstract philosophy it's not <laughs> vedanta you may have heard me say this before vedanta is a solution to the problem of human suffering is your suffering a concept so it's not conceptual even though we get that impression and we take that 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 orientation but when we talk about these lofty teachings of nirguna brahman and saguna brahman nirguna brahman brahman without qualities describes the ultimate reality the reality because of which we all exist the reality which is your reality if your reality is nirguna brahman if you can discover that you, the truth of who you are is non separate from nirguna brahman non different from nirguna brahman with that recognition your world view is very dramatically changed and you become free from suffering and then you ask well where does saguna brahman fit into this whole picture and in a again in a non conceptual way if everything is nirguna brahman what in the world am i experiencing right now we have to account for our experience notice in mathematics and and pure uh, philosophy if there is such a thing who cares about experience you're just trying to it's like math you're playing with numbers we're not playing with numbers here so the ancient rishis revealed the truth that ultimately there is one underlying reality which has no qualities we call it nirguna brahman and we further come to understand and hopefully personally discover that your unchanging consciousness is not separate from that nirguna brahman but then we still have to explain all of this nirguna brahman is non dual what are you experiencing right now mass of duality and if and i'll give you the typical misguided answer all this is just illusion that's not what the doctrine of maya teaches <laughs> doctrine of maya properly understood is not a doctrine of illusion that's not a very satisfying example vedanta has a responsibility to answer your questions if i say oh this is all illusion is that a sat satisfying answer will you say okay well <laughs> you might <laughs> but it, it doesn't work in the long run nor is it what our traditional teachers taught this idea that this you know this you know they they you know, you you probably have seen in some hin hindi movie where there's a sad who's smoking this bong and really really high and he looks up and he says sad kuch maya hai <laughs> <laughs> this is all illusion <laughs> well if you smoke enough marijuana <laughs> it <laughs> it seems like illusion the point i'm making is this is not shankara's traditional advaita vedanta he never suggested that the world is illusion but in fact we're back to the two perspective idea that we talked about a few minutes ago there are two perspectives on this pot one is there's no pot there's only clay the other is of course there's a pot you can put water in it and drink it tell me which of these perspectives is right and that's a trick question <laughs> each of them is right from their chosen perspective more than that one doesn't negate the other the fact that this is only clay doesn't negate that i'm holding a pot 
the fact that there is only, uh, I would put it the other way, if, if I call this a pot, doesn't negate the fact that there's only clay. These are two simultaneously tr true perspectives, but they're different perspectives. And this is how Shankara's teachings work. Is they wa Shankara wants us to, un to look at the world like we look at this pot. And it's not that complex. So from the standpoint of clay, clay is nirguna, relatively speaking. Clay has no size. Clay is, is not capable of holding three ounces of water. <laughs> so from that perspective, clay, relatively speaking, is nirguna. But how difficult is it to shift to a saguna perspective? And that is the pot I'm holding is about three inches wide, about two inches high, and can hold about three ounces of water. It's just a shift. I say just, but it, it's a shift of perspective. Well, if we can do that with a pot, we can learn to do that with the world. And we can appreciate both perspectives simultaneously. And that is to understand that there is a non-dual uh, reality because of which everything exists. We can call it Nirguna Brahman, that's fine. But simultaneously true is Brahman with form, Brahman in the form of this world of duality. And the key point here is one doesn't negate the other. Both of these perspectives are true from their individual standpoints. And if you ask how, how, you know, how can we reconcile these two, that's what the whole doctrine of Maya is about. And it's not so much a, a doctrine of reconciling as a doctrine of understanding that there are two perspectives. Tell me, do I have to reconcile? What does it mean to reconcile clay with pot? Is it necessary? To know that this is nothing but clay, do I need to reconcile it with the potness? And to know that this is a pot, do I need to reconcile it with, with clayness? These are two separate realities. In fact, one of our big confusions when we come to the teachings of Vedanta is we fail to keep these two perspectives separate. It causes massive confusion. We intermix these two perspectives. And I, I get all these questions. I would imagine that in, a, in perhaps a third of these questions are at least partially due to this inability to separate these two perspectives. Shankara uses some complex vocabulary for this. He talks about absolute reality. He calls it paramartika satta fundamental reality of Brahman. Then he talks about an empirical reality, Vyavaharika Sapta. And then he gives us one more, the reality of your mind, the reality of imagination, the reality of dreams, which is Pratibhasika Sapta. You can imagine if you mix up, you know, just to finish this topic, and we'll see if you have a follow-up question, but Imagine if you mix up your dreams and your day-to-day -day life. You'd really be a mess, right? <laughs> so imagine if you mix up this empirical experiential level with absolute reality. If you mix it up, it's a mess. So better dream is dream. Empirical reality is empirical reality, experiential reality, and absolute reality are absolute. And we do, if we keep them separate, then a lot of this confusion goes away. Do you have a follow-up question on that, please? How did this avidya start? Uh, why were we um, think we are separate from Brahman? Okay. How did ignorance? And I'll, I'll paraphrase your question. How did ignorance start? If ignorance started. Here's Vedantic logic. You'll love this. 
or you probably not. <laughs> and most people don't. I love logic. You may not <laughs> love logic. Anything that if if something starts, it means there was a prior condition. So if ignorance started, there was a prior condition which was not ignorance. If the ig if the state was not ignorance, it was knowledge. So knowledge was there, and then ignorance began. It's illogical. So that's the problem with certain questions, like how did ignorance begin? It's beginningless, really speaking. And uh, Shankara and other great teachers will say there are certain things in life which have no beginning. If you've been born a gazillion times, each time you were born, you were born ignorant. If you were born an infinite number of times, for an infi infinite time you have been in a state of ignorance. So many, we have to become more comfortable with this idea of beginninglessness and infinity. When, when did we know, we know this world began 14 billion years ago, or Puranas will give us a different number, but if we ask, when did Ishvara begin? Or when did, the uni when did this cyclic universe have its first cycle? So these are questions based on our inability to understand that which is beginningless, that which is infinite. So sometimes our questions are illogical because we're not ready to cope with this idea of, of infinite. Okay? <laughs> All right. So let's take a few more online questions here. Question from Sheila, who lives in Bangalore also. And Sheila asks, what, what does fearlessness mean in spirituality? In, in, and she makes reference to Bhagavad Gita, but this idea of fearlessness goes way back to the Upanishads. Abhayam pratishta bhavati. This Taitriya Upanishad man talks about fearlessness in a couple of, of uh, sections. What is the relationship between fearlessness and enlightenment? Fear is a normal human response to feeling threatened. By the way, isn't fear a good thing? Keeps us out of trouble? <laughs> if we didn't have fear, so imagine your ancestors not fearing wild animals <laughs> and becoming dinner for those wild animals. Fear protects us. Fear keeps us alive. Fear is not your enemy. So fear is a normal human emotion, and it's a good thing. It helps us function. And that fear, as, as I was about to say, is driven by the f um, sense of being threatened. When you feel threatened, you experience fear. Whatever is a threat, in ancient times it was wild animals. In modern times, it's, it's speeding cars and people with guns. Whatever it is, it's something different in every, every generation. Now, how does, what is Vedantic's per, Vedanta's perspective on this? Is that if you discover, or let me say when, we'll be more optimistic. When you discover that your true nature is unchanging consciousness, that which is unchanging can't be threatened, right? That which is unchanging can't be threatened. What happens to fear? Now, that's a little abstract. So, in fact, let me, let me connect it to our earlier topic about different degrees of reality. In a dream, can the dream elephant hurt the you who's laying in bed? Not at all, because they are different layers. This is a completely different response 
to uh, Sheila's question. So first response is unchanging consciousness can't be threatened, therefore no fear. Second response is if we understand that the enlightened, enlightened person knows that this world is less real than my true nature. Let me say that again. Just like in a dream. A dream world is less real than the you laying in bed. The enlightened person knows. You know, the enlightened per person has woken up, right? The enlightened person knows that this world is less real than my true nature. <coughs> and with that perspective, what like a dream elephant can't hurt the person laying in bed. The enlightened person knows whatever is happening here around me can't affect me because it's not as real as me, as my true nature. Okay, that is Sheila's question. Let's take another one here. And this is uh, Sajit. Sajit lives in Pune, and he asks, could you briefly explain the concept of Jivatma and Paramatma? Also, whether they are both the same as per Vedanta philosophy. And I, we just spoke about this. Sajit's perspective is so common and so unhelpful <laughs> to turn these brilliant teachings into just another philosophy more concepts. And I know that's how it's often taught. And, you know, what, what to say? Things get taught incorrectly. So it's up to us then to find proper teachings. And properly understood, Vedanta is not a philosophy. Vedanta is not a number of concepts bound up in some body of knowledge. Vedanta is a method which is meant to lead you to discover that your true nature is Satchirananda Atma, which is utterly non-separate from the reality we call Brahman. So a method, methodology, not a philosophy. Okay, with that in mind, what is it we can, let's, we'll just, uh, Rephrase, what is a relationship between Jivatma and Paramatma? How do we understand? We, there's a wonderful metaphor that's used again and again. By the way, some of these questions, let me just suggest to all of you and all of you watching online, if you have some basic questions like this, watch my series of videos, Introduction to Vedanta. It's six videos, they're not long, and they will answer probably more than half of your questions, including this one. So in, if you haven't watched that introduction to Vedanta, of course, if, if, you are, if you've been with these teachings for years and decades, it may not be helpful, but if you don't, if you're fairly new to these teachings, that's absolutely the right place to begin. Introduction to Vedanta on my YouTube channel. And in that series of six videos, one of the many things that it explains is relationship between Jivatma and Paramatma, and it explains it in non-conceptual terms. <laughs> because Jivatma is not a concept. Are you a concept? How many concepts are sitting here? How many concepts are, you're not a concept. So Jivatma is you. Paramatma is God, Ishvara. Is Ishvara a concept? If you think Ishvara is a concept, you've got some remedial work to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, th and that's okay. <laughs> so you are not a concept, Ishvara is not a concept, Jivatma is not a concept, Paramatma is not a concept. How can we understand the relationship between these two? Many ways, but a very common way is a metaphor used many, many times in the scriptures. And we say that there is one all-pervasive consciousness. Atma is consciousness. Atma, 
true self, is fundamentally speaking consciousness. Sat chit ananda, the word chit means consciousness. Sat means unborn, uncreated, unchanging. Ananda means boundaryless, limitless. There is w one unchanging, limitless consciousness. We use the word atma to refer to that. And in the context of this question, we can call that one paramatma, because it is being boundaryless, infinite, vast, all pervasive. So that one is paramatma. And that paramatma in, in this traditional metaphor is compared to the sun. The sun is shining. Where does the sun shine? On the entire planet. So the sun shines everywhere, of course. Assuming there are no clouds, the sun shines everywhere. Now, on a sunny day, and we actually have a nice sunny day today, on a sunny day, suppose outside you place um, many buckets of water. And today we have got maybe about 30 people here. Suppose there are 30 buckets of water outside. Each bucket is full of water. The buckets represent physical body. The water inside represents your mind in particular. You can develop this a lot, but let's take it a little bit short, briefly, here today. So that, shi that sun shines on these 30 buckets of water. If you look inside, if you look at a bucket of water, you see the sun reflected. If you look at the next bucket of water, you see the sun reflected. In fact, if you look at all 30 buckets of water, you see 30 reflections of the sun. How many suns are there? One sun, 30 reflections. Suppose we, supp we change the word to manifestations. One paramatma, manifest as many jivatmas. This is not the only metaphor we use, but it's a very helpful <coughs> one. To, and it helps us understand this relationship between one and many. And we have this, this conf not conflict, but this confusion that comes again and again in Advaita Vedanta, and that is we start off with Dvaita. There are many. Many jivatmas, how do we reconcile many jivatmas and one paramatma and still understand it to be non-dual? Well, this metaphor shows so nicely. One sun, many reflections. One all-pervasive consciousness that is manifest in your mind, in my mind, in the mind of every living being. So that's how we understand. Okay, that's Sajit's question. Here's a question from Anjali. Anjali, it doesn't say where she lives. Anjali asks, can euthanasia be considered swadharma? Uh, wrong word. Can, can euthanasia be considered dharmic for a pet? What about pet Parents, interesting, pet parents. <laughs> I've never had a pet, so I'm not a pet person. But interesting, pet, pe pet persons consider themselves parents <laughs> of their pets. It's just, I find it interesting. It's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> so you have some human children and you have some dog children or cat children. I <laughs> something like that. <laughs> okay, what about pet parents? who give consent for their pet to be put to sleep, as in the case of an old dog whose health is deteriorating rapidly. Is euthanasia, a, and f we'll take it a, a step further, is euthanasia okay for, for your pets? And how about for human beings? We'll take that one next. So we'll start with pets. The principle of adharma, in fact, that was just in the recent if you don't understand fully how the principle of adharma is a principle of least harm, 
And if that's not familiar to you, we just... Uh, yeah, Lee's Dharma, Ahimsa. So if the principle of... Uh, thank you. So Dharma is based on the principle of Ahimsa. Correct. And Ahimsa is properly understood as least harm. If these ideas are not familiar to you, I just published a video on vegetarianism, which deals with this topic very nicely. Watch that video and you'll, you'll understand very clearly. An interesting point I make in that video is when we translate Ahimsa as non-violence, we're usually making a mistake. We're usually mistranslating Ahimsa. And the metaphor I, I gave, the example I gave in the video, is this. If I hurt you, but not violently, how is that? <laughs> but if we translate ahimsa as nonviolence, that's what it suggests. Also in that video I say, if we anesthetize cows before we kill them, is it okay to eat hamburgers? Because the cows didn't suffer. So you see the danger with this translation of nonviolence. In that video, I suggest that that translation is largely due to Mahatma Gandhi's use of ahimsa as a political strategy. And as a political strategy, it was, I think, quite clever, but we're not talking about politics, I hope. <laughs> We don't want to talk about politics these days, so we're talking about dharma. In the context of dharma, spiritual life, ahimsa does not mean non-violence. It does mean least harm, and that's an important distinction. If the distinction isn't clear to you, please watch that, that video. So least harm sh means whenever we make a decision to follow dharma, means to take the path of action which results in the least harm. And it's a very simple principle. Application can be very complicated, but the principle is very simple. So in the case of an old dog, should you allow the dog to die a natural death, or should you have the dog euthanized? Well, you know, some people may argue well, who are you to interfere with the dog's karma? Mm -hmm. The moment you took that dog as your pet, <laughs> you are interfering <laughs> with the dog's <laughs> karma. <laughs> so there's no question, you are part of the dog's karma. Your karma and the dog's karma are interwoven. You know how that works in families. So why should it not work with a dog? In a family, parents and children, their karmas are interwoven. You can't say, what is father's karma, what is brother, etc. It's all intermixed. So same, if you have a pet, your karmas are interleaved with the dog's karmas. So you have to make a decision. Your dog is near the end of its life. It's limping around. It's not eating properly. It's getting sick again and again. My gosh, why make that dog go on suffering? Dogs had a good life. You gave that dog a wonderful life as your pet. Fine. That life has come to an end. Let that life end with less suffering. So that's an application of the doctrine of least harm. Can that be applied to human beings? Why not? Why not? If someone is at the end of, let, let me give a very concrete example. A person is in a hospital suffering from, from stage four pancreatic cancer. Now, pancreatic cancer, I'm, I, as I understand, is one of the most painful kinds of cancer. And because it's stage four, it's not just in the pancreas, it's all over the body. So this patient has cancer throughout the body. The patient is in incredible pain because of the pancreatic cancer. And you give this patient, you want this patient to be comfortable. Give him some morphine. Doesn't do a thing. Double the dose. Still nothing. 
quadruple the dose of morphine. They're still writhing in pain. Now comes the question. The doctor tells you that in order to relieve the pain, the amount of morphine to be administered would be a lethal dose. Should that morphine be administered or not? This is a realistic scenario. And according to the doctrine of Dharma, least harm to withhold that lethal dose of morphine is harmful, causes more suffering. So in that kind of situation, of course, I gave you a pretty, pretty obvious situation. Most situations are not so obvious, but the idea is to understand what course of action leads to the least harm. And in that, in that particular situation, euthanasia would be considered dharmic. In fact, I find it interesting to put it in the other terms. To withhold that lethal dose of morphine is to cause, suf uh, to cause unnecessary suffering. That's a dharma, absolutely a dharma. Okay, do we have other questions here? Raise it. Way in back. You'll, you'll, need, you'll need the microphone. Just a follow-up to the one answer that you gave. Um, so there are different types of suffering. The one you mentioned was physical. Then there are mental suffering. So would you would it be dharmic if someone's suffering, me you know, mentally, to euthanize them? Okay, that's a good question. So euthanasia we can justify for that person dying of pancreatic cancer. Suppose a person has chronic depression and they want to die. I'm tired of this life. I'm always depressed. Let me die. And they go, they go to, uh, was it Finland or Sweden or some no North uh, uh, European countries in which Switzerland. Okay. So where, where you can legally uh, get a prescription for medications which will, which will end your life. So is that dharmic? Well, those are two entirely different situations because stage four pancreatic cancer is untreatable. Depression is treatable. <laughs> so if the person feels suicidal, they, they don't need pills to end their life. If a person is suicidal, they need proper treatment. And we know that there are treatments which can handle even the worst cases of chronic uh, depression. Doesn't mean that they become all happy and everything. It means that like many illnesses, cr chronic depression and other mental illnesses, we can manage. Can't, mostly we can't make those problems go away. For example, someone who suffers from schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. You, there's no cure for schizophrenia, there's no cure for bipolar disorder, but there are medications which help manage those, those disorders and can help the patient live a meaningful life. Will that life be more difficult because of the illness? Of course. But who said, when you were born, did you get a guarantee that you're going to, you will have an easy life, no illness, no problems, nothing, like a get out of jail free card. None of us were born with that kind of guarantee. So if you have a chronic physical or mental illness, which is treatable, then euthanasia is a dharmic in such situations, because treatments are available. Okay, another question uh, here in the hall. Raise your hand. Uh, in back here. In uh, follow-up to these questions about suffering and all that, um, people physically suffer when they are in their body. And according to the Garuda Purana, 
they say that after people die and then the soul is soul or the jiva is taken and they are suffering they suffer according to their karma i so didn't understand they means who the soul the after soul the of dies. the departed person yes. suffers after death after death depending on their karma according to the garuda purana they mm -hmm. say you know uh, they are taken and their more suffering so called hell what they call mm -hmm. depending on so if the suffering is done during your body according to your karma mm -hmm. why is there a suffering after the death until they get a new life okay i thank you um i haven't studied garuda purana um i understand there's a rather lengthy section that talks about death and the uh, doctrine of karma and one thing about the doctrine of karma is that different scriptures will treat it differently so the garuda's presentation of the doctrine of karma has to be understood side by side with other descriptions of the doctrine of karma and they don't all agree with each other <coughs> So what the Gar if the Garuda Purana again I don't know after what a conventional understanding of the doctrine of karma is this after you die suffering comes to an end stop full stop after the moment you die no suffering and if you wonder what that experience is it cannot be different from your experience of sound sleep dreamless sleep or being under anesthesia you experience nothing and think about it for someone who's suffering that state of experiencing nothing is actually a great relief <laughs> because experiencing nothing is a whole lot better than experiencing agonizing pain so according to a conventional understanding which could be different than the garuda purana i don't know but the conventional understanding according to the doctrine of karma is that at the moment of death suffering comes to an end but associated with that person is this huge body of sanchitta karma which is waiting to be exhausted and because of that huge body of sanchitta karma the sukshma sharira the subtle body the transmigrating soul will be driven by the force of karma to take another <coughs> physical body another incarnation the nature of that incarnation depends upon which karmas are ready to be fructified that sanchitta karma accumulated karma is infinite in quantity according to the again conventional understanding of the doctrine of karma you have had an infinite number of prior lives in which you've accumulated an infinite amount of good karma infinite amount of bad karma and because of that infinite body of karma you go on getting born again and again but in a given life that given life cannot be the product of an infinite amount of karma because then you'd have to live for an infinite amount of time so every individual lifetime is determined not by sanchitta karma but rather by prarabdha karma prarabdha karma is a portion of the sanchitta karma which is ready to fructify remember these karmas are past actions which have not yet yielded their results and so prarabdha karma is a a set of good and bad karmas which are ready to yield their results now there's a question about quantity and what is a quantity and quality how's that So first of all if the if the karmas you're born with are very few you're not going to live very long infinita happens if your karmas are very long 
you could make it to a hundred. I'm sorry, if your karmas are many, if the prarabdha karma is a lot in quantity, you might make it to a hundred. We don't know. But what's more interesting is the ratio of good and bad karmas among those prarabdha karmas. And that is, if your prarabdha karmas, remember the, the, they're coming from an infinite no store of both good and bad karmas, so the individual package, as it were, of prarabdha karmas could be mostly punya or mostly papa or anything in between. If the karmas you're born with are mostly punya, good for you. <laughs> you're going to have a life which is extraordinarily happy and relatively free from suffering, which probably means, in fact, if, if you were born with karmas which were exclusively punya karmas, you would live a life utterly free from suffering. That's our definition. So the, uh, our, a life based on pure punya karmas means a life free from suffering. Such a life could not possibly take place in a worldly realm. So a life in which you live free from suffering is what we call swarga, heaven. Notice it's not necessarily a place, except we know for sure it's not New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> you, ca you can't be born here or any other state in this country or any other country. You can't be born without suffering. So, to be born with only good karmas is a lifetime in heaven. Notice I say lifetime. It's a finite amount of karma. When those karmas are exhausted in your heavenly domain, what is it, shoots and ladders, that kind of thing, you, you take another birth and, and see what happens. Conversely, if you're born with all papa karmas, it means a life of pure suffering. That's our definition of nataka, hell. So hell is a life of pure suffering, not necessarily a place. It's an experience and a lifetime in which you experience nothing but suffering. And what we experience here in New Jersey and elsewhere is something in between. And it, it, it varies a lot. So this is a conventional understanding of the doctrine of karma. The Garuda Purana may describe it differently. And then you have to ask, well, which is right? Don't ask me. What I can say, though, is this traditional explanation of the doctrine of <coughs> karma is supported by many, many scriptures. It's also supported by many great sages and saints who have thought, who have analyzed it, and it's also reasonable. It's, it makes sense. And what the Garuda Puranas teaches may or may not conform to that. But here, just a final comment here, we have to be ready to accept the fact that we have all kinds of scriptures which we do not accept as being equivalent with each other. So we have the Vedas. But then in the Vedas, there's a portion with all the rituals and the portion with the pure wisdom of the ancient rishis that Vedanta is based on. These portions of the Vedas are not equivalent. They're completely different. They teach different things and they're intended for different people. We have to get used to this concept. We do not have, you know, the, pr the problem, by the way, we'll, we'll end, I'll make a few comments about this, and I think, um, oh. <laughs> got quite, quite a few questions we haven't uh, answered here, including, uh, yeah. Okay, I, I <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm just uh, not able to, we're not able, we don't have the time, and I, f 
honestly, I don't have the physical energy to do this for much more than an hour, so we'll wrap up shortly. Um, but l let me, let, let's conclude with a really important observation that many people overlook, and, and that is Hinduism is so unlike other religious traditions which are based on a primary scripture. Judaism is primarily based on the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament of the, of the Bible. This is the scripture. All other scriptures are, sub they have other scriptures, Talmud, etc., but they're subservient. This is the scripture. Um, Christians will follow both the New Testament and Old Testament, and they're both accepted. You can't, if, if you're really a Christian, you can't say, oh, those Old Testament rules don't apply. In fact, theologians go on arguing <laughs> about this stuff endlessly, and we're not theologians, so that's not our concern. But the Bible, Old and New Testament, is the scripture for Christians. The, um, Quran is the scripture for, for Muslims. Yes, there are subsidiary scriptures, but the Quran is the scripture. You cannot say the same about Hindu tradition. You can say that Hindu tradition began with the Vedas. Absolutely correct statement. But you cannot say that the Vedas are the scripture for everyone. Why? I just said, first part of the Vedas are devoted to rituals. <coughs> Suppose you're not interested in doing rituals. Second part of the Vedas is devoted to spiritual wisdom. <coughs> Suppose you're not interested in spiritual wisdom. These are two different parts of the Vedas which are intended for different spiritual seekers. Already with the source scriptures, we already see this division, a division which, which acknowledges different religious and spiritual needs require different religious and spiritual guidance. So we start with this first division in the Vedas, then we have later generations of scriptures and all the Puranas, <coughs> which are, <coughs> the Puranas are teaching, are, are collections of teachings set in the context of stories. So those are meant for a different kind of student. They're not meant for everyone. And then among the, the Puranas, there are different categories. There are Shaiva Puranas, and Shakta Puranas, and Vaishnava Puranas, and so forth. So we have, we have this more division. Then we have in the epics, Ramayana, Mahabharata. Mahabharata is a great example. We were just talking about a doctrine of karma. The Mahabharata talks about the doctrine of karma again, and again, and again, and again. And every time it talks about the doctrine of karma, it talks differently. <laughs> every teaching in the Mahabharata, they're not all in perfect agreement about how karma works. One, one person says one thing, another person says one thing, and they get into big arguments. Yudhishthira and Bhima and Draupadi got into a huge argument about what, what this all means. The argument went on for chapters in the Mahabharata. So we have these different things. And then just to conclude this, and then following all these scriptures, then we have all of our great teachers. So we have Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, Ramanuja's Vishishta Advaita, uh, Madhva's Advaita. Why do we have so many? And they're all different. And that's good, because we're all different. And this, you've heard me talk about this principle of adhikari bheda, which I really think is un, an undervalued and, under, and not properly 
understood concept in, Edwa in Hinduism in general. And it's a, doct it's a teaching that says we are all individuals, we are all different, we all have different spiritual and religious needs. And a one-size-fits-all religion is not suitable. And to me, some other religions look like one-size-fits-all. And it doesn't work very well. The one uniqueness of the Hindu tradition is that it totally rejects this idea of one-size-fits-all. It acknowledges our individual differences and encourages us. If you, if you want to ensure a better rebirth, then follow these rituals of the Vedas, of the Karmakanda of the Vedas. If you want moksha, follow these Upanishads, the latter part of the Veda. If you want to understand the doctrine of karma, read the Mahabharata. If you want to um, increase your devotion to Lord Vishnu, study the Vaishnava Puranas. <laughs> or to Lord Shiva, Vaishnava Puranas. So you get the idea. So many different teachings which deliberately address our individual needs. This principle is called Adhikari Bheda, and it's rarely, I've rarely heard it discussed, but I think you can appreciate how important uh, this principle is. So again, I'm sorry we couldn't cover more questions. There are many more questions here in our local, uh, stu among our local students. There are many more here online that I haven't been able to get to. We'll try to get more questions in next week. We'll continue, of, of course. And we'll conclude with our press. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kaschadukha Bhagbhavet Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor ma amritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Tatsat. See you next time.